Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, here in these next few moments as we open your word, awaken our hearts to your truth. Lord, speak life-transforming truth into our families today, into our lives. Challenge us to become more like Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, welcome back to this continuation of a series called Family that Pastor John started us into last week. He shared a message called Shared Values. And today we're going to be looking at bestowing honor. Honor is a word that means to, to set apart, to, to place more importance on. In the Hebrew, it says to add weight or to place value on. And if we're honest, as we look today in our culture, in our families, it seems that honor is eroding all around us. Today, we wanted to, to launch into this series to bring honor back into our families as we met as a staff a few months ago to plan out the sermon series and said, what could best minister to and help this congregation as we see a lot of times strife and tension and, and discord in families that are happening. And it's not characterized by the honor that we see many times in our life. You see, in our families, a lot of times we get into this syndrome, which I often call the, the broken record syndrome, where we relive over and over these same scripts of, you did this to me, no, no, you hurt me, and no, you did this, and we just start going and reliving back these scripts that I call broken records. I remember when I was growing up in Garland, Texas, as a young boy in the 70s, we used to get on our bikes, me and my brother, and we would just take off riding for hours on end. And if you were like that, your parents, like back in the day, they didn't care. They were just like, see y'all at dark. And we'd be gone for hours. And we went to this, this, this five and dime store where they sold those, those 45 records. And back in the day, it was the Bee Gees. Staying alive, stay. And like, so we bought the, the staying alive. And my brother and I, man, we were like rambunctious boys. And I, it wasn't too long before we had messed up. You know, there's like one groove through the, the whole record, but we kind of, the needle messed it up. And it'd be like, staying up, staying up, staying up. And it would like get caught in this thing. Ugh. We get in these broken record patterns that we need to break through. And today, I believe Christ wants to regroove the message in the heart of our families, away from dishonor, and to bring honor back into our families and our homes, and not just there, but in our workplaces and the people that we interact with and in this congregation. We become a church that is just filled with bestowing honor on people. You see, tension in our lives and in our families can come in a lot of ways. Maybe you're a, a young mother and you've got little kids and they're, they're not honoring you, and it's you go to the grocery store and you're like, I'm gonna count to three and you better, and then it's like, Six, seven, forty, and they're still doing it. And you're like, ah, I just want to go home and make popcorn and get away from all of this. Maybe you're a, a teenager and you feel like, man, my parents are always breathing down my neck all the time and they don't respect me. They don't honor my opinion. And maybe you're the parent of a teenager. And if you're like my parents, they, they said, we just want to lock you up when you're like 15 and feed you through the bars. And then when you're 18, we'll let you out. Maybe you're a grandparent and you're seeing the values that you've always cherished eroding in this culture. And you're like, honor, where is it anymore? Maybe you're in a, a blended family where you have hers and, and his and you're trying to bring all these kids together. And there's exes and it's complicated and there's just a lot. And you're saying, how do we find honor in the middle of all these moving parts? So today, I want to dive into Romans chapter 12 with you for the next few moments and to see what the Apostle Paul has to say about living a life of Christ-like character and honor in our families. And then the, what we can gain from that, the rewards, the joy, and the harmony that we're going to get when we live like that. Look with me with what he says. Respect is earned, but honor is given. Respect is earned, but honor is given. Look what Paul writes in verse 9. He says, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. And look at this verse. He says, outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another. What would it look like in our families and our relationships if, if I were going to honor you and you're, I'm going to try to outdo you and you're like, no, I'm going to outdo you. And like, oh, and we're going back and it would just take all the wind out of the sails of, of tension and strife. But many times we get caught up in this chicken or the egg thing. Where it's like, well, I would 
honor you, but you hurt my feelings. So as soon as you honor me, then I'll honor you. And it's like, we never get off a high center. And so apostle Paul is saying, you take the initiative. You be the one to show genuine love, to outdo one another with honor. You see many times pride comes in into our life and we want to be a hoarder of honor. And we like say, want to get it all around us and look at me and what I'm doing. And aren't you wishing that you were me and look at me and I've got all this honor and I don't want to give it out freely. But all throughout scripture, God talks about the importance of it. In the New Testament, he says, husbands, honor your wives. If you think back to the Ten Commandments, honor, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. One of the most famous honors is the fourth commandment, and Paul quotes it in Ephesians chapter 6. He says, honor your father and mother, for this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Honor your father and mother. No matter how old you are, we're called to, to continue to honor them. We may disagree with them at times. We may not be on the same page, but we're still called to honor them. Jesus knows in our lives that honor starts deep within our hearts. It comes from a place that's beyond just lip service honor, that it goes deep. Listen to what Jesus said, and he's quoting the Old Testament here when he says this in Matthew 15. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Wow, that's a stinging indictment that there was people that were doing lip service in their worship and they were they were just saying all the right things and going through the motions but their hearts were disengaged from from honoring him but he calls he desires more than sacrifice he wants your obedience and your honor there was a young man who got married and in premarital counseling the pastor told him he said do one thing man every morning before you go to work i want you to go in and give your wife a kiss and he's like okay and they're in love and every morning he hmm, he smooch her and then he go off and then over time life began to happen and then they tension came in and crept in and they just experienced and there was like uh and it's like the mundane and everything and he begins to slip and one day he's in his car about to start it in the driveway to go to work and he's like oh and he just gets out and He's like, got to kiss my wife. Gotta kiss. And he goes in, he like gives her a peck. And then he's like, he's on his way. What had started as this heartfelt thing of honor in his life had devolved into this duty in his life. See, the same kiss was taking place. It's just what was behind it was different. And so Jesus, he calls us in our families to wholeheartedly, not just lip service, but to wholeheartedly love and honor those people around us. The second thing that we find out from Paul in Romans chapter 12, as he's calling us deeper, is Paul is saying this right here. Harmony sounds great. Harmony sounds great. Listen to what he says in verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but, asso but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Live in harmony. It doesn't take a masters in music to understand that, that there's something special about harmony. You can be just an average person. If you hear one voice singing a line or one instrument, that's called unison, and, and that can sound good. But then when you put another note with that, then make it a more complex structure, a, a more uh, complicated, and, and the tones begin to interweave together. Isn't that a gorgeous sound? Like we know harmony, like we hear the Beach Boys, round, round, get around, uh, and you hear those chords, and then like you hear like today's world, the pentatonics. Maybe you've heard that group. They have incredible harmony. Symphonies, you know, you hear all the strings and everybody weaving together. In music, harmony is not easy to produce. It's one thing to stay on your note, but then when somebody else starts doing another one, it's like you can get distracted, you can get off. And so it takes a lot of work and it takes focus to stay in harmony. That's how it is in our relationships and our lives as well. Even in scripture, we see we're men of God great men of God. Paul himself struggled to find harmony at all times with people. In the book of Acts, Paul and Barnabas go on 
a missionary journey and they take along with them a young man named John Mark. About halfway through the journey, John Mark, he bails on him. He, he leaves and he goes back home and Paul is not amused with this. He's upset about it. Later, when they go on another trip, Barnabas wants to bring John Mark with them again and Paul's like, no way. So Barnabas takes John Mark and they go off on their way and go to Cyprus where Paul gets Silas and they go off to do their own thing over here. There was disunity and there was not harmony. But by the grace of God and his strength, if you read on in scripture later on, they were able to reconcile and come back together to the point where Paul valued this young man, John Mark. Later, when he wrote to, to Timothy in his second letter, he says, bring John Mark with you the next time because he's such a great helper in ministry. Reconciliation and harmony took place. There's those people that are in our lives as we look at our daily lives and our family that kind of get under our skin that can be annoying a little bit. Think about it. That person in your work or your, it's your family like, ah, oh, they just. And so the, the challenge is in this scripture in, in Romans chapter 12 is that Paul doesn't give us any wiggle room to say, OK, I'm going to be in harmony with those people that I just have the same viewpoint or the same political view or that they we worship in the same way. But he says, live in harmony with all people. Live in harmony. Listen to what Jesus says in Luke chapter six. He says, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even the sinners, and he's here talking about the pagans and about the heathen people, the unbelievers, even the sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. Think about it. It's easy to love people that are easy to love. But it's more challenging when people are challenging. And he's calling us to love them and to, to find harmony and to peace and to, to bury the hatchet. Listen to what Peter says in chapter 3 of his first book. He says, finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Be sympathetic. When he says to be sympathetic, he's saying that that's the idea of two hearts pulling together as one. When I'm sympathetic, I look through your eyes at a situation and see what maybe why you're reacting the way you are. Or doing what you're doing is because of what you're going through. And I'm compassionate about that. The King James Version calls it the bowels of compassion. You go, what is that? But he's, what he's talking about is in the ancients, they believed that the emotions were seated in your gut. That it wasn't just a, a thing a, a up in your mind or just some flippant words you would say when you had compassion that you really you felt it deep within your soul. That you came alongside and you, not just kind words, but you felt true compassion and sympathy. And finally, Peter says to live with humility. To be humble. When, Paul, when Peter talks about being humble, he's talking about not just putting on humility like it's a shirt or a cloak that you can take off later and, and every now and then you can put on humility. But what he's saying in his word picture is to put on humility in your life and, and tie it onto you so that it becomes a part of who your existence is. Show humility. And when you begin to do that, you'll begin to show honor. Leonard Bernstein, the great conductor one time was asked what is the hardest instrument to play he thought about it for a minute and he said second fiddle he said I can get a bunch of people to play first violin but I it's real tough to get somebody to play second fiddle but without second fiddle we have no harmony think about it for a moment maybe God's calling you in some circumstances to humble yourself and to say you know what I'm going to take second fiddle because it's just as important and I'm going to lift you up Lastly, Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 12, what Jesus says is blessed are the peacemakers. Listen to what he says in verse 18. Paul says, for if it, if it is possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. He was continuing Jesus' thought from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus says this, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of of God. Insofar as it depends upon you, 
live at peace. You know, this, this business of making peace with people is a conditional business. And let me explain that for a second. That it takes two people to quarrel, and it also takes two people to find reconciliation. You can want to have peace all day long, but if that person over there is not ready to resolve it, then what Paul is saying, insofar as it depends upon you, you get your side of the equation right before God. You're not always going to find it. But when you begin to do that, that's what God has called us to do, to find peace in every situation. There's people that are cantankerous out there that are looking for a fight and they're grumpy and stuff. But a wise old pastor one time told me, he said this, just because someone's fishing for a fight doesn't mean you got to take the bait. Somebody may be trying to push your buttons, but in humility, in peace, lower your pride. You may have the winning argument, but it may be time for you just to bite your tongue for a moment and to humble yourself and make peace. In Scripture, in the Old Testament, there's a word for peace that you're probably familiar with, and it's the word shalom. You've heard of it, peace, shalom. Basically, what that word means is that I don't just wish that bad things don't happen to you, but I wish for you the highest good. In your life, I want shalom, the highest good for you, for my kids, for my relationship with my wife. As I look at you through eyes of love, I want the best for you. In your life, this whole message that Paul and Jesus were presenting was so countercultural in first century Palestine. They had become used to hearing this, this doctrine of an eye for an eye. And if somebody punches you, you just punch them back. If they steal your coat, you go take theirs. But Paul and Jesus come on the scene and flip it upside down. And they say, no, there's a new game in town. That you love your enemies. And as the peace of Christ begins to rule and reign inside of you, the fruit of the Spirit begins to, to develop. And you say, man, so many times I, I whiff this and I don't get it right. And I say things to my family I shouldn't have said. But that's where the grace of God comes in and his strength. There's a great theologian named Henry Bosch who once said, To live like Christ is not natural. It's supernatural. To live like Christ is not natural. It's supernatural. Think about it. That we, In my own strength, I can't do it. I'm going to lose it. I'm going to get mad. But when Christ's spirit begins to indwell in me, the old patterns of dishonor are changed over. And I begin to become more loving. And I begin to honor people around me as his supernatural presence lives within me. Maybe today you're at the end of your rope emotionally and spiritually. And you're drained. Today in Holy Communion, you have a chance to come and to receive the true body and blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to strengthen your faith, to forgive you, to go out of here and live in newness of life, to look at people through what I call the lens of love, the lens of love. You say, what does that mean? Look what Peter says in verse eight of chapter four. He says, above all, love each other deeply because why? Because love covers over a multitude of sins. What does that mean? It means that when I begin to look through a lens of love, those little things that irritated me about you, those little things that I want to get mad about, I begin to have more grace. And I begin to put a positive construction on things as I look at you. It changes my perspective. Imagine as Christ looks at us in our lives, in a time in our lives where we didn't even think about honoring him, we didn't even know what that means. It says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In this country, we like to honor famous people, presidents, we military heroes. If you go to Washington, D.C., you'll see the Vietnam Memorial with just thousands of names engraved there. We honor people. But today, Jesus Christ says, I've come to honor you and listen to what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 49. He says, see, I have engraved you. On the palms of my hands. Oh, my friend, he honors you today. His, your name is engraved on his hands. And beyond that, the demonstration of his love is engraved in his hands. As you look closely and you see the nail scars there. He says, this is how much I love you. That I would go to the cross despite those times that you didn't bring me honor. I lay down my life willingly because I want to spend eternity with you. He honors us. I close with this illustration. There was two ladies 
that were in an assisted living center. One lady whose name was Ruth, and another lady was Margaret. The backstory before they got to the center was that in their respective churches growing up, that they each played piano and organ. And they led in worship all throughout their lives. And now they're in this assisted living later in life. And Ruth had had a stroke on the left side that paralyzed the, the left side of her body. Margaret was just the opposite. She had a stroke on the, the right side and she couldn't move this side. And one day they were in the lobby of the assisted living and they were talking about their days when they used to play piano and organ. And they looked over and there was a piano there. They thought, I wonder if we could go together and you play the right hand and I'll play the left and just see what happens. They go over to this, the piano bench and they pull it out. They begin to play old hymns of the faith, amazing grace. It is well, how great thou art. The music began. The harmonies began to meld together. They were working together in their weaknesses to find their strength. And pretty soon doors were opening down the halls. People were wheeling out their wheelchairs and walkers and coming down to gather around to see what the sound of this music was. It was an amazing sound of harmony when two women came together and they worked together through their weaknesses to find their strength today. Christ is calling us and our families to put aside our weaknesses, our pride, to clothe ourselves with humility, to look at our families through eyes of love and imagine what will happen when we go out this week in our homes and we begin to outdo one another with showing honor. To God be the glory. Amen.